Hello and welcome to the DBA Reactions Guide to In-Memory OLTP, aka Hecaton. I'm your host, Brent Ozar. I'm a Microsoft Certified Master and MVP, wrote the tools SP Blitz and SP Ask Brent, and among a lot of other things, I present all over the world, including recently at the SQL Bits Conference in London, where I dressed up as the Stig, all kinds of fun for their uh, costume party. One of the other things I like to do in my spare time is write stuff over at dbareactions.com where we try to illustrate what database life is like using animated GIFs. We try to find interesting little animated images and match them up with captions that kind of go along with what database life is like. It's not for everybody. It's kind of an acquired taste. I was ever shocked that anyone ever was interested in reading what I put over there. Now I wanted to go through and talk about some of the things that I find interesting in SQL Server 2014. I love SQL Server 2014. It's awesome, but it does have just a few gotchas. So I did a session over at SQL Bits that goes in depth across all kinds of things in SQL Server 2014, but today we're just going to focus on Hecaton, aka in-memory OLTP. Now to understand what this feature is, we want to go back in time a little bit and think about a command we used to have called dbcc pin table. This is back in the SQL Server 2000 days where we had the ability to stick, to stick one specific table in memory at all times if we wanted to. We could say, oh, you know what? That sales table over there, it's really important to our business. We want to pin this to memory so that it's absolutely always there. Very quickly we found out it wasn't such a good idea because we didn't always track how many rows we added to the table. When people added new fields, suddenly it would drain our server completely dry of memory even if we weren't querying it all the time. So that actually went away pretty quickly and instead it took us a little while, 14 years I guess, but we got a replacement for it that's even better, in-memory OLTP. This is a new way of storing data, totally different structures, and our table can live just in memory if we want and never even hit the disk, which can be interesting for things like staging tables in data warehouses. Maybe I never want them to even be written to disk. If my SQL Server needs to restart, I'll just start the load job again. I can even get blazing fast stored procedures if I'm careful enough to compile my T-SQL into DLLs and only use a subset of T-SQL functionality. And in theory, it totally eliminates locking and latching so I can make sure that my uh, SQL Server stored procedures always get done on time. This sounds at first perfect for today's fast growing databases. We're always throwing around terms like big data where we're pouring data into the database very quickly. This is not that feature. Everything that I'm going to show you today is going to be based out of screenshots on books online. For example, the total in-memory size of all durable tables in your database should not exceed 250 gigabytes. That's not terabytes, that's gigabytes. You can't have more than 250 gigs worth of data. Which is interesting because that also kind of gives you a hint at if you're going to put more data in there, you have to be able to guarantee that you're going to upgrade to the next version of SQL Server before you run out of space. If, for example, if I start putting in 250, 300 gigs worth of data, I got to move on to the next version of SQL Server as quickly as possible, but who knows when that's going to come out, right? Or whether or not this restriction is even going to be limited. What people will often point out is that you probably don't need that much data in Hecaton. It's probably just a subset of your tables that are actually that high performance. It's not like you put all of them in there. So we're going to just reel back and only put some of our tables there. So what are the requirements for that? Well, of course, we have to be on 64-bit SQL Server 2014 uh, Enterprise Edition. This is one of those expensive edition features. Read that bottom bullet point there. SQL Server needs enough memory to hold the data. To account for row versions, you should provide as much memory as two times the expected size of your in-memory tables. So if you have 100 gigs worth of data, you're probably going to need 200 gigs worth of RAM, and that is only for the Hecaton tables. 
Now, I'm not even talking about all of the other tables that are in your database and things like execution plans and query workspace memory. So this is something that's really designed for people who can throw a lot of memory into their servers. But as long as you can do that, you can go ahead and move forward with it, and you just need to keep in mind a few limitations. For example, there's uh, computed columns are not available, replication, file stream. These are kind of niche features though, right? Like, who really cares if replication dies off? I wouldn't mind putting a few bullets in its head myself. Except that there's more slides. Can't have foreign keys, can't have checks, can't have unique constraints, no column store, that's kind of okay. Can't have a separate clustered index, no DDL inside transactions, next page. Uh, can't update our primary key columns, so whatever your primary keys are, whenever that data is inserted, you can't ever change that, no updates of that data whatsoever. You can't create an index, you can't alter a table. Some of that starts to get a little tricky. What do you mean I can't alter the table? You mean I can never change this table once it goes live? Well, technically you can, you're allowed to do that. What you have to do is go create a new table and then move all your data into it, which of course means you're gonna to have to stop all access in there in order for this to happen. You're gonna to have to shut down your application, go create the new table, move the data across, rename the tables, and then say to your application, you're ready to go live. Mm, man, that seems kind of odd for an application that was all about high concurrency and very frequent insert updates and deletes. What do you mean I'm just going to have to shut the application down? But wait, there's more. If you're going to change a table, or if you're going to alter an index, anything like that, you have to drop all of the compiled procedures that reference it. Not disable, you have to drop them. So now our outage just got a little trickier. Now we have to stop the application, drop all the stored procedures, re uh, move all the data across our tables, add our stored procedures back in, and then let our app go live. Oh, this is frustrating. And even just the memory that I have to deal with while working with that becomes tricky. This is the next set of those instructions that talk about all the work that you have to do. Now I want to focus in on the very last part of this down at the bottom. There must be enough memory for the copy because the memory is not freed immediately when you go drop the old table. And you have to start dealing with equations about exactly how much memory you're going to need just in order to do this table switcheroo. Oh, golly, that's kind of handicapping. So let's go on and look a little deeper at uh, memory optimized tables. The last bullet point on there Again, going in accounting for our row versions, let's read that last sentence. The actual amount of memory needed will depend on your workload. So even if you're not changing the table, even if you decide, oh, I'm just going to put this table in and never change it because that stuff's too complicated, you should monitor your memory usage and make adjustments as needed. What do you mean, make adjustments as needed? Most of us, when we go out and deploy a brand new application, we don't get the luxury of saying, oh, it looks like I need 128 gigs more memory. You just need to add that into my server. Or I don't have the luxury of saying, well, it turns out this particular table design doesn't work, so I'm going to have to change it and make things around a little. I'm going to have to stop all the applications, get the data out, put the data into another table, and so forth. There is no such thing as make adjustments as needed for a live running production application, especially the kind of application that you want to use Hecaton with, something that is highly concurrent. And there's more. So now let's talk about some of the other limitations at the server level that you can't do when you're using in-memory OLTP. You can't do data compression, you can't do partitioning, you can't use transparent data encryption. Sure hope you weren't storing any personally identifiable data inside there. Can't use multiple active record sets, can't use mirroring, can't use link servers, bulk logging, minimal logging, or change tracking. Next slide. Can't do database containment, can't do cursors, table stamps, auto close. Oh, hey, I actually love not being able to do auto close. Transactional DDL, user databases, all kinds of things that are interesting in there in terms of cross database transactions as well. And then let's talk about what happens if you put your T-SQL inside of natively compiled stored procedures. Because this is one of supposedly one of the big benefits, is that we're able to make these go insanely blazing fast once we compile our T-SQL. Turns out, there's a few things you can't do in there as well. 
inline table variables, cursors, external number stored procedures, CTE, subqueries, compute, into, select into, output, case, you can't use a case, user defined functions, user defined aggregates. Next slide. Uh, offset, union, intersection, accept, outer join, apply, pivot, and unpivot. And I, what I love is how they refer to these in there. Take the intersection line. This operator is not supported. Remove intersect from the natively, natively compiled stored procedure. In some cases, an inner join can be used to obtain the desired result. What they're basically telling you is this is a release feature for developers because they're going to have to go through and make massive changes to their application logic unless they're starting with brand new stuff from scratch. There is no simply just enable in memory OLTP or just turn on Hecaton for this feature because odds are not only your table's not going to be uh, working compliant, your stored procedures in T-SQL likely will not be compliant as well. But let's say that you go do through all of that work. You go rewrite your stored procedures, you change your tables in order to match it. From then on, you're able to get really fast, lock-free transactions. Because as Microsoft tweeted it themselves, nothing stops a hecaton transaction. And let's drill down into a little bit more detail. As we look in books online, they have, wait a minute. This says guidelines for retry logic on transactions for memory optimized tables. What do you mean retry logic? I thought you just told me nothing stops a hecaton transaction. Well, obviously something must be stopping it if I have to go and retry it. Well, if I look at the more details for this, a common cause of the errors that cause a hecaton transaction to break is interference between concurrently executing transactions. This whole feature was supposed to be for high concurrency systems. What do you mean that if I have concurrency, I may have to retry my logic? Okay, all right. Let's just suck it up. Let's go ahead and talk about what it is that we need to do in order to build in retry logic inside our highly concurrent applications. One of the things I love about Microsoft is that they ship example codes uh, or code that will tell you exactly how to deal with what they're uh, telling you to do. So for example, here inside a stored procedure, they've built their own retry logic, and it's not really that hard. It looks like a little bitty wall of text. It's not bad. But I'm going to zoom in on one particular part of it. If we have to retry and there's an error number that matches these certain uh, numbers, let's go ahead and roll it back and then issue a wait for. We're going to sit here and just wait for some measure of time. It's up to you to figure out how much time you need to wait for and then just go try your transaction again. That is the example that you are supposed to follow. You're supposed to figure out how long your wait fors need to happen and whether or not they're long enough or maybe they need to, or whether or not they're too long and you need to tighten them down. Just to put this clear here, the idea for a highly concurrent system is that you're going to introduce your own wait for delays because the database can't handle the concurrency for you. Oh boy. Now watch what happens when you go live with this and you try to tune it. One of the things that's interesting about performance tuning, things I find really interesting, is how statistics and execution plans play in together, concepts like parameter sniffing and uh, SQL Server. So statistics on SQL Server's memory optimized tables are not updated by default. You have to update them. It's up to you to figure out when your statistics need to change, which isn't really that big of a deal. In this day and age, it's fairly common to see database administrators roll their own statistics updates code, like using Ola Hollingren's excellent maintenance scripts. But when statistics gets updated, get updated, what happens next? You would want to recompile your stored procedures with the new statistics so that you get better execution plans? Not so much. If you want a new plan for your stored procedure, the answer is to drop and recompile, drop and recreate that stored procedure. For natively compiled stored procedures, execution plans are optimized when the procedure is compiled. When you create the stored procedure, you get an execution plan that does not change even when the data in your table changes. So they tell you, therefore, the tables need to create a representative set of data and statistics up to date before the procedures are created. 
That means when you go to write brand new stored procedures, your database already has to have data that looks like customer data in it for you to even get a plan that looks vaguely familiar. This is amazing to me. I'm, I'm like blown, blown away, flabbergasted that we're not able to change execution plans on the fly, that we actually have to do all these drop and recreates in a system that's supposed to be highly concurrent. But wait, there's more. This is the kind of thing that I don't even expect a product to ship with. DBCC CheckDB does not even check anything with your Hecaton data, your in-memory OLTP that's so mission critical and highly concurrent. You can have corrupt crappy data in there and we don't have any way to catch it with CheckDB. So as I go through and I give this kind of speech to developers and database administrators, usually they immediately see this and want to bash the eject button on the database. I've had about enough of this, let me get out of here. Oh, it gets even funnier. In this first release of in-memory OLTP, the only way to remove Hecaton is to drop the database. So heaven help you if you have a developer who just decides, I'm going to play around with it, turn it on, and see what happens. I'm just going to go turn this over on in my development environment. Heaven help you if they do it in production. You're going to be dropping that database, moving all of your data back out of it, creating a new database, and going from there. Hecaton doesn't make a lot of sense for most production scenarios, but there are rare scenarios where it does make sense. And I describe those scenarios here on the screen. I would just pay very close attention to all of these bullets because this is not a negotiable feature. It's not like you get to pick and choose which limitations you want to follow. Now, bash SQL Server's in-memory OLTP a lot here, but I really think SQL Server 2014 is amazing. This is a great release for senior database administrators who are trying to solve very specific pain points and they know what they're doing. Delayed durability, the new cardinality estimator, clustered column store indexes, these are incredible new features that really give you a lot of flexibility and power as a database administrator. But for the rest of the features, especially the stuff that's version one from you know coming straight out of the gate, don't go rushing into this. Bad things happen when you go rush in without looking. Be very careful about the pain points that you're trying to solve and only implement features that are really going to help. That's the DBA Reactions Guide to In-Memory OLTP and SQL Server 2014. If you want to see the rest, I'll put out uh, additional webcasts talking about through the rest of the features that I looked at uh, during our MySQL Bit session. Thanks, everybody.